Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're welcome to have Dr. Ashok Sastry, a uh, kidney nephrologist uh, based out of Sarasota, Florida, who happens to be a longtime old friend of both Justine Amder and myself. Uh, and Dr. Sastry is here to help uh, shed some light on uh, what's going on on the front lines as a clinician uh, with a snowbird relocation geriatric population uh, on the west coast of Florida. So welcome, Ashok. Uh, I also I also want to invite back and, and acknowledge that Justine Ander, our program coordinator and uh, captain, uh, chef and, and bottle washer, uh, who does it all for the ASA behind the scenes is here as well, who's also a, a close family friend. And uh, we're also welcome to have uh, Jills Friedman, a uh, longtime all-star patient advocate and the, the ASA chief strategy officer and the founder of, of ACOR and of uh, Smart Patients. And uh, ACOR, just so people understand what that was, is the Association of Cancer Online Resources, which uh, Jill's basically brought together a couple hundred uh, cancer communities back in the 90s when the internet first started. So we have a lot of questions, Ashok, for you, just in regards to the overlap of sleep apnea and kidney and chronic disease and mm-hmm. inflammation. But I think the highlight of that and what's on the first of everyone's mind is the COVID crisis and how that's affecting you and your daily routine and your practice, your patients, but also how is the sleep component sort of working its way in through all this. So I'm going to throw it to Jill's to to lead off with more of the the, the medical questions that we have as laymen's. We're not doctors. You are. You're trained. uh, But we know enough to be dangerous. And we just want to make sure we're getting the best information out there uh, so that our community... uh, can, can, can prepare and and help themselves Mm -hmm. the best they can right now. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Let me do like a super fast intro about uh, one medical condition I have, which is high blood pressure. I discovered a high blood pressure about 20 years ago and Mm -hmm. found out that it was very hard to control. We tried seven different kinds of medication, nothing worked. Uh, So it's a real pleasure to have you here and to be able to ask you questions specifically about hypertension, high blood pressure. Sure. We often speak in our community about the co-occurring condition of sleep apnea and high blood pressure. Can you tell us about the role of the kidneys in controlling blood pressure? Yeah, the, the kidneys are very, uh, I guess, central in controlling uh, high blood pressure. Uh, essentially, they uh, control high blood pressure by managing uh, sodium, uh, the electrolyte sodium in your bloodstream. And uh, they're primarily responsible for excreting the proper amount of sodium uh, that you know the average person intakes uh, in their diet. And whenever there's an imbalance in that, that's one of the, the first early signs or early, uh, I guess, uh, parts of the mechanism that lead to the development of hypertension, where the, uh, the, the sodium, you could develop sodium retention, and that leads to a whole cascade of events which lead to elevated blood pressure. Um, initially, you know, uh, th- this, can, this can be because of dietary causes, uh, and then as time goes on, various imbalances in hormones which regulate uh, high blood pressure and sodium, ret- uh, sodium excretion uh, essentially perpetuate the process, and as time goes on, it becomes more difficult to control uh, high blood pressure. And it's not uncommon as time goes on for patients to initially require one medication, but subsequently start adding more medications, up to possibly four medications to control bl- blood pressure at times. And it usually it all goes down to uh, the kidneys and how they regulate sodium uh, balance, essentially. So the, the okay. way I would understand that, Jules, is, is the kidneys are sort of the last in the line uh, of the organs before... Uh, from the heart, from the brain to the heart to the lungs to the kidneys, does that make sense from a linear well, perspective? Can I say it kind of differently? They are the filtering organ. Right. Yeah, they, they they filter a lot of they, they filter a lot of substances, and uh, but where it comes to it, where hypertension comes in, it's really the electrolyte sodium, which uh, is the most important uh, component of the development of hypertension. Um, yeah, the kidneys filter waste products, uh, uh, many different you know substances which could be considered waste products like urea, um, you know for example acid byproducts of you know just daily you know uh, your Western diet which produces a lot of acid. Uh, the kidneys are responsible for excreting that. 
but when it comes to hypertension, uh, it's really the electrolyte sodium which matters. That's why salt, sodium restriction or salt restriction right. specifically is a very important uh, part of the uh, uh, treatment of hypertension is uh, restricting uh, salt intake because of that imbalance of sodium which develops as a consequence, which le- leads to hypertension essentially. So, so, so is that, uh, sorry, is sorry. that one of the reasons why some of the treatments include a diuretic for exactly. high pressure? Yep, exactly. And that's what led to a lot of the earlier studies. Uh, uh, that was the main motivation behind what a lot of the earlier studies, which led to the recommendation of uh, diuretics as one of the initial uh, you know, uh, treatments for hypertension. Um, and obviously, as time go- has gone on, we we've understood more elaborate hormonal mechanisms behind why hypertension develops. And that's what has led to a lot of the other uh, medications being recommended for the treatment of hypertension, uh, which block hormones, which perpetuate sodium retention. Uh, You know, the most important class, uh, as you mentioned, diuretics are uh, diuretics called thiazide diuretics. Uh, Medications like uh, hydrochlorothiazide or chlorothaladone, uh, they are primarily diuretics which manage uh, hypertension through sodium excretion. They help the kidneys get rid of the extra salt. And then there are other class of medications such as ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers. Uh, they're responsible for blocking hormones which tell the kidneys to hold on to salt uh, by basically uh, reducing the production of hormones such as uh, angiotensin or aldosterone, which is a main hormone which acts on the kidneys to absorb sodium. And so those are the two really class of medications which uh, are typically the first and second line drugs for the treatment of hypertension. Yeah. So since Adam was speaking of COVID-19, I just read uh, two days ago the CDC data and more than 50% of the people who died from COVID-19 and where people with high blood pressure. Yeah. There is this huge uh, discussion about should people who are treating their high blood pressure with either of the treatments in the two families you mentioned, should they mm-hmm. stop taking it or should they keep on taking Should they stop or keep on taking those medications? Yeah, th- this is a little bit of a controversial topic, um, you know, because a lot of the studies, uh, earlier studies, um, uh, you know, that have implicated uh, w- w- what we know is uh, one of the main receptors uh, through which uh, the coronavirus, the novel coronavirus enters is ACE2. Uh, the ACE2 receptors, uh, which are found, you know, quite abundance in uh, the lung tissue, uh, seems to be the main, I guess, uh, route through which uh, the novel coronavirus uh, kind of wreaks havoc in the lower uh, respiratory tract and a lot of resp- is responsible for a lot of the uh, mortality and morbidity that we're seeing from uh, the uh, the uh, the novel coronavirus infection. There was some in vitro studies uh, early on, <clears throat> many years ago, that suggested that the use of angiotensin receptor blockers or ACE inhibitors increased the population of the ACE2 receptors in the lung tissue. Now, this has never been replicated in actual living beings. Uh, there's been no human studies which have looked at whether patients who actually take ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers are truly at higher risk of morbidity and mortality from uh, the novel coronavirus infection. Now, there are ongoing studies looking at that right now, but obviously this is too early to tell. Uh, and that's the reason why uh, you know a lot of uh, many of the uh, international uh, you know uh, medical societies. Uh, I think the European uh, Society of Cardiology right away uh, came up with the recommendation that patients uh, do need to uh, continue these medications uh, because of the uh, obviously their their crucial importance at reducing uh, risk of cardiovascular events, namely you know heart attack, heart failure, and stroke. And uh, the the feeling from, you know, especially the European uh, uh, Society of Cardiology, was that uh, the benefits of um, reducing these uh, events uh, still outweighed the uh, the potential theoretic risk 
uh, based on in, in vitro studies that uh, uh, you can have this uh, so, somewhat higher risk of uh, uh, morbidity and mortality from the uh, coronavirus infection. There are some studies actually looking at, uh, clinical studies looking at uh, um, the uh, patients who have been on ACE inhibitor and androtensin receptor blockers in influenza. And actually, uh, uh, there were some small clinical studies uh, uh, suggesting that patients who do take ACE inhibitors and androtensin receptor blockers for high blood pressure or whatever indication uh, actually do a little bit better uh, when infected yeah. with influenza. So uh, I think that the jury's still out. Obviously, coronavirus is a very different virus than viral infection than influenza. Um, but I think that the, the studies still need to be uh, uh, performed, published, peer-reviewed before we can safely say, you know, whether you should continue your uh, medications, your ang- ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, or you should stop them, you know, because of, uh, you know, concern of uh, coronavirus infection. Yes. There are, in fact, a couple of preprints, so they're not yet peer-reviewed, but a yeah. couple of like recent preprints that go in the same direction of what you said, saying that, yeah. in fact, the ARBs, people that are taking those ARBs, seem to be doing better. Yeah. At the same time, the French hospitals, the uh, Parisian set of hospitals, came up with data that showed that direct, people taking diuretics are doing worse. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, it's, I know it's all very new, very complicated, and very early. So, Yeah, I think it's still early to tell uh, you know, whether any particular class of uh, uh, antihypertensive medications is really beneficial or harmful. But uh, I have a feeling as, uh, as the year goes on, we're going to get uh, a lot more information in this respect. Sure. Let's go back to something that you know a lot better. Okay. <laughs> uh, what about the connection between sleep apnea and uh, chronic kidney disease? So, um, you know, it's probably a two-way street. Um, you know, obviously, uh, the same risk factors that lead to uh, the development of obstructive sleep apnea, um, you know, obesity, uh, diabetes type 2, um, heart disease uh, that perpetuate chronic kidney disease or lead to chronic kidney disease can also lead to sleep apnea. Um, there's a considerable, population, a considerable number of patients with chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease that uh, do wind up having sleep apnea. Um, and that can be a major factor with respect to their resistance to antihypertensives as well. Uh, it's kind of a double whammy. Uh, you have the, uh, uh, the impaired uh, ability of the kidneys to get rid of sodium. And on top of that, you have sleep apnea, which really makes uh, treatment of hypertension uh, very difficult. Um, let me let me stop you there, Ashok, because that, that's a sort of a question I'm getting hung up in, in the loop in the process. Mm-hmm. So there's the preventative aspect of the sodium and the electrolytes, whether we're getting it through our our our, our the what we drink or what we eat, I imagine. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's the, the the component of what is the the untreated sleep apnea doing that pressure on our organs, our systems, on our kidneys, and that effect on on the kidneys. You know, as far as the the correlation, the chicken or the egg here. Which sure. we don't need to. Yeah. We don't need to answer that today. Yeah. Uh, but what can we tell our, our our patients, our communities that are home? You know, is it is it? You know, we there's. There, I've always heard anecdotal evidence of, of of gout and positional sleep apnea therapy. Just getting people onto their side and, and mm-hmm. just getting off their back. Uh, you saw major improvements with, with with that kind of chronic inflammation disease in in, in your sort of neck of the woods. Um, can we say three D a loop that we don't know exactly which one starts, but once you get into it, it really, it keeps it, on going. Like, it's a vicious cycle, uh, yeah. exactly. Because, uh, yeah, patients who have advanced chronic kidney disease, as it progresses, you get the progressive fluid retention, and uh, that leads to, you know, obviously the vocal, war, vocal cord edema, the, you know, uh, the edema in the larynx, and uh, that tends to become an issue. Uh, uh, I think the main uh, where where we work where we get involved with sleep apnea is uh, essentially uh, uh, resistance to add the blood pressure medications, um, and obviously reducing cardiovascular events. Um, you know, I think that's the the two main fo- uh, foci of uh, addressing sleep apnea in our population. Uh, you know, we, we definitely tend to see um, a lot of uh, 
issues with uh, worsening heart failure, worsening, um, obviously, high, the nocturnal hypoxia can perpetuate uh, a lot of uh, you know car- stress on the cardiovascular system, uh, especially in patients with impaired kidney function, uh, more advanced kidney disease, uh, especially uh, as they progress uh, approaching you know the need for transplant or dialysis. Um, you know, it is interesting that a, a lot of the uh, you know blood pressure fluctuations of the labile blood pressures we see in many of our patients. Uh, do tend to get mitigated with uh, uh, you know, basically appropriate sleep studies and uh, application of you know uh, CPAP, non-invasive uh, you know, uh, uh, ventilation. Uh, the lability actually tends to you know re- be reduced, and obviously uh, well, there well, are. Well, been... what, what does lability mean in English? Uh, fluctuating <laughs> blood pressures, meaning you know, uh, let's say for example at 8 a.m. You, you have a blood pressure of you know. 120 or 80, but then it skyrockets to 200 over 80 by 1 p.m. Uh, so I, that's one thing we've observed uh, uh, in a lot of our patients with more advanced kidney disease, uh, that these uh, very uh, wild fluctuations in blood pressure uh, to d- do tend to become less uh, in severity uh, when, they, uh, when their sleep apnea is treated. Um, but I think you know, obviously there there are studies which really have been more mo- more modest in their uh, conclusions with uh, uh, how well blood pressure is reduced with just sleep you know uh, sleep apnea alone. Uh, but I think the the main focus really with addressing sleep apnea in our population is the cardiovascular uh, events. Uh, you know I think it clearly does address that issue. Uh, you know it can reduce the risk of sudden cardiac death. Um, you know, from sleep apnea. Uh, so I, I think for that purpose, we, we do uh, obviously uh, inquire about these, uh, uh, about these questions when we see our patients and, uh, you know, pretty, uh, pretty open to referring them to sleep study, especially if they, uh, they have any of the signs uh, on history and uh, especially if there's a resistance to uh, blood pressure medications. Uh, it's, 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 it's encouraging to hear that, uh, you know, from a, from a cynical view, from a patient perspective, the roadblocks and the testing, I'd rather people go straight to treating, uh, especially with a, a non-invasive intervention like PAP therapy. Sure. Um, and it, it's nice to hear that those patients that are, that are successful with their PAP, uh, they're having better results that you're seeing in them in the clinic or less of them in the clinic. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's an important message to get out there to people. I know Justine wants to to, to, to chime in here. So, okay. uh, I, I'm just curious because you know a lot in my family history, it's um, more diabetes focused than than high blood pressure. So, what are some of the uh, uh, things that a patient would be feeling that might you know take them to their doctor? Because I mean, most of us don't have. Uh, uh, the tools at home to take your blood pressure. And even if we did, we probably wouldn't know what it meant. Um, Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, what takes you into the doctor? What kind of red flags are you feeling, seeing to, you know, prompt you to give your doctor a call, go in there and see, see someone, um, you know, in regards to, to that condition? Um, Yeah, obviously, uh, you know, sleep, you know, if there, Daytime sleepiness is a is a very common uh, symptom. Uh, waking up with a headache. Uh, yeah, there's just a lot of vague symptoms that a lot of our patients will describe. Just this general sense of, you know, low energy, not feeling well, uh, just not able to carry out uh, activities that they would like to do or previously were able to do. Uh, it runs the whole gamut. There, there's really no specific, uh, you know, set of symptoms. Uh, do you, do you see a lot of the nocturia or the or the, the the nighttime wakenings and that kind you of know, stuff? It, yeah, you know, yeah, you. I mean, we see that a lot. Uh, I mean, obviously, you can get nocturia. The you know, the getting up to use the bathroom a lot at night, independent of you know the the effect of sleep apnea, just from having uh, chronic kidney disease itself. Uh, you can uh, you know have the uh, frequent uh, bouts of going to the bathroom at night to urinate. Um, so it is hard, especially you know, as uh, with our more advanced uh, kidney disease patients, it can be a little, little different, difficult to tease out whether going to the bathroom a lot at night is just from you having chronic kidney disease or 
sleep apnea. Obviously, a lot of our patients a little bit with more milder disease, uh, you know, the, the development of nighttime urination uh, with mild kidney disease, that does raise a red flag of, uh, you know, possibly uh, needing uh, evaluation for sleep apnea. Um, yeah, obviously, in the context of, you know, other symptoms or uncontrolled hypertension, uh, I think uh, uh, we'd be very open to referring that patient to further evaluation. You're on mute, Adam. <laughs> Once again, Justine's telling me what to do. So, <laughs> I w I, you know, I wouldn't be alive without her, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and we all know that. Um, you know, now in this time of, of physical social distancing, since we can't go out to dinner anymore mm -hmm. uh, and discuss uh, from a patient perspective and you from a clinician perspective, the state of health care, um, you know, there, there are some positives coming out of this COVID mm -hmm. crisis, some observations retrospectively. I mean, we're going to learn a lot of good things in, in spite of a, a, a pandemic. Sure. Um, you know, and it, it, it brings up a thought, you know, I've, I've gotten as talking to Jill's over the years, uh, being born and raised in France and, and you having a Southern Indian background, even though raised in America. Uh, it's interesting to see how we, our American population are treating our elders or geriatrics in this sort of COVID crisis. Mm -hmm. I think that spotlight is really interesting. And I just... You know, from from your position as, as a taking care of primarily a geriatric population and, and a snowbird population, and 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 you know whether the clusters that we're seeing locally or in in the condos or in the 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 overage communities, you know, just you know your perspective as because I, I know you, you you take care of your your parents as well, and and mm -hmm. and you know I've gotten to know Justine and I've gotten to know your family over the years, and. You know, happy to say I'm seeing the, the, the dolphins and the porpoises and the fishes come back up in the backyard. So I can't mm -hmm. wait till you to your neighbor one day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you exactly. know, there's 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 a world that I, I'm, you know, for our generation as as that as that bridge between uh, the older generation and this younger generation as our job and as your job as a clinician is mm -hmm. to sort of bridge that way for our children to make sure that there's the world is is, is right for them going forward. Mm -hmm. um, so I just. I, I know you're a man of the world and, and I know you have a lot of thoughts about it. I didn't know if you mm -hmm. just wanted to open up or talk about some of that maybe. Well, I think, uh, I think we're, we're seeing, uh, you know, some important issues in that respect, uh, especially in the state of Florida. Um, you know, without getting into further, uh, you know, detail or, you know, kind of going down that political tangent, uh, we do have an issue with nursing homes in the state of Florida. Um, and we're, we're seeing that a lot. Uh, we're seeing that become a big issue with the, uh, with the coronavirus pandemic, uh, as uh, I think especially we're seeing here in Sarasota and you know, obviously other parts of uh, the state of Florida where uh, clusters of infections are predominantly developing in nursing homes. And, uh, you know, I think that's uh, hopefully going to bring a lot of spotlight to, uh, you know, how infection control is done in nursing homes. Uh, how residents and nursing homes are treated. Uh, I think it's at least just uh, discussing amongst, uh, you, know, uh, you know, just ourselves here in, you know, Sarasota. I think the, there's a lot of conversation about how uh, the uh, nursing home industry is, uh, you know, really handling this. And uh, uh, I, th I think there could be a lot of room for improvement. Uh, you know, transparency has uh, uh, become a big issue, especially being a medical director of a dialysis clinic who, uh, you know, takes care of a lot of uh, patients from dialysis, from nursing homes who are on dialysis, uh, that lack of transparency has uh, been very unsettling. Uh, we've had to do a lot of detective work uh, because the health department is not disclosing where these facilities are. Uh, we've, you know, had to resort to a lot of uh, detective work to figure out uh, where the clusters are and where to uh, ice, how to isolate patients and to target which patients need to be isolated uh, who are on dialysis. Um, you know, there is uh, two, two types of patients that we obviously, uh, in, in the outpatient dialysis clinic that we're concerned about, obviously the patients who have known infection with COVID-19, but there are also patients who we, we call the patients under investigation, the PUI patients. And these are patients that have not had, you know, definitive uh, positive tests, but have 
presumed or possible exposure to uh, patients or staff uh, who have been infected. And uh, this has been a big issue. Uh, you know, obviously, we've had to uh, make a lot of uh, uh, adjustments in the outpatient dialysis unit clinics, a lot of schedule changes. Uh, you know, our staff have been working very diligently to uh, really accommodate the uh, the change in, uh, you know, the scheduling because of, uh, you know, this uh, unfortunate lack of transparency on the uh, nursing home point. Do, do you envision sort of a world in this next year where it's, it's really going to be truly the haves and the have nots, whether you have COVID or have the virus so that you have a dialysis only COVID clinic and a, and a, and a clean one? Or is that where we yeah, have we, to go? Yeah, we, we've actually gotten to that. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the clinic where I'm a medical director at, uh, is uh, the designated uh, COVID unit uh, where entire uh, schedule has been clean, cleared out just to accommodate patients with uh, known infection and uh, patients who are uh, the uh, patient under investigation uh, category. So we've already come to that. Um, you know, and it's one of those, uh, you know, it's a situation that we, we envision will probably continue until the uh, vaccine comes out. Well, I, I don't want to steal the airways because we know I, you can see I've had too much coffee already <laughs> this morning. Uh, Jill's, Justine, you have any sort of last thoughts or questions you want to talk to Ashok about? Or uh, I think this has been a, a very informative conversation for our community. And I think the more we can learn about how all these systems work with each other, uh, going forward is is just going to be a, a breath of fresh mm -hmm. air because you know we're we're now as a patient advocacy a group and association it's I think it's going to become our job to educate especially remotely and virtually uh, and to get this stuff down into tangible chunks mm -hmm. that people can you know sure. care for themselves at home so that you know that when they have to come to the clinic it's 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 a necessity it's not a a luxury yeah yeah as the European in the house here I'm going to say that. If the result of this COVID-19 pandemic in the U.S. is to bring back a large percentage of people who are, have been thrown into retirement homes back into the house of the younger generation, it would be a magnificent gift. Uh, since I arrived in this country, I've always been shocked at how mm -hmm. Americans get rid of their elder ones instead of learning mm -hmm. from them. Yeah. That's... Uh, it's a sad statement. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, my hope with uh, what we're seeing here, in, at least in Florida, obviously I can't speak for the rest of the country, is that uh, uh, there'll be more uh, scrutiny on how the uh, nursing homes are uh, really operating and how they uh, treat their, uh, their residents. So. And unfortunately, you see the same statistics across all the European countries where, I mean, the percentage of people that are in nursing homes is much, much smaller to start with. Yeah. In every one of the European countries mm -hmm. where you have nursing homes, you have had a catastrophe. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So, Justine, as the mother and as the wife and as, a, as, as the Mary Poppins of this group, uh, what's on your mind with Ashok since uh, he's on the front lines in your backyard where your family's at and your daughter's at and your friends are at and they're wondering about kids going back to school and things of that nature? Yeah, well, I mean, I first want to say thank you to, <clears throat> excuse me, Ashok and, you know, his team that he has there and everybody that's here in our local community and, and nationwide for for taking care of us and, and helping us and you know, being, uh, being on the front lines and in, and in harm's way. And we, you know, wish every single one of you to remain uh, safe and healthy. Um, so we can uh, all enjoy each other on the, on the other side of this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I guess I would say um, it sounds, you know, this, this last part of the conversation that we're having that, you know, even as maybe, when things are starting to settle down and do open up, there still might be a little bit of a separation between <clears throat> the grandparents per se and 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 families with with kids or young children mm -hmm. because um, you know if if they are really a susceptible 
uh, the older population is much more susceptible just, you know, getting the kids back out and, and active and doing all those things, um, you know, might, might bring something back around to, to mm -hmm. those older individuals that we love. So, you know, even though things might open up a little bit eventually in a couple yeah. of months, hopefully or so, that um, there still might be some of those types of requirements. Yeah, I think we're, we're going to see, you know, even though we're, we're told that things are going to go back to normal, I think in, until the vaccine, uh, an effective vaccine comes out, uh, I would tend to agree. I, I think there's going to be uh, uh, a, a great deal of uh, uh, still uh, uh, precaution um, and, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, I, I still think a but lot rightfully of rightfully uh, so distancing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just conversations with a lot, a lot, a lot of my more, uh, you know, uh, savvier patients, uh, um, you know, that they're, they're of the opinion that they're pretty much not going to uh, go back to normal until there is an effective vaccine available and they're prepared for, you know, significant uh, changes to their lifestyle uh, until that occurs which uh, I think is a very, very educated, very intelligent way to go. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we started to hear about vaccines from uh, the president who immediately said that it was coming like very, very shortly in a matter of a few months. So most people are completely unaware that historically it has taken over 10 years to develop a yeah, vaccine. Exactly. And the, until now, the fastest uh, story of a vaccine development is five years. Yeah. So yeah. hopefully this time, if they do it in 18 months, it will be like a revolution in vaccine development. No, I think that that would be uh, that would be quite monumental if they can get this uh, get this out by uh, uh, I'd say probably late 2021. Uh, I think uh, we have to be very cautious. I, anything in anything in science, unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, I think the general population is made to believe that uh, you know science is sort of a black magic type of. Uh, you know, situation uh, where presto, something, uh, something, you know, magically appears, but it's not like that. It's, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of, a lot of things, a lot of steps that need to take place before you have, uh, you know, the finished product, uh, whether it's with treatment with the antivirals uh, or uh, the vaccine. Uh, we still have a long way to go. Yes. Uh, and we should all be hearing this clear communication then the last time there was a worldwide pandemic, the Spanish flu, yeah. it killed 50 million people and most of the death happened in the second time second it wave. reappeared. Yes. Wow. Yep, exactly. Yeah, so th this is not something that's going to go away. I think uh, it's uh, anticipated it's to come back. It sounds like it's the ultimate marathon. Yeah. Um, think, and, that, and we have to prepare ourselves for, for that battle. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ashok, I, I can't thank you enough. I think we should do this again because um, I'm sure yeah, there thanks. will be a lot of questions when we when mm -hmm. we play this live from the audience, uh, and that we could do some deeper dives on and clarify some things that we might have missed. Sure. Uh, I would be uh, remiss if I didn't throw up the U. Yeah, considering <laughs> considering where you went to the U, and you you know yeah. I'm from Miami and, and that connection. So you know, let's 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 pay respect there. Um, Justine, do you want to sort of do the house cleaning and, and set up for what who's what's next uh, that'll be on after the, this airs? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So um, uh, after uh, speaking here with Dr. Sastry uh, later this evening, we will have a uh, presentation uh, from Kevin Bradley, our awake uh, curriculum on the relationship between high blood pressure and uh, sleep apnea. So we'll be able to dive into this just a little bit more this topic uh, on the day. And um, I think that Ashok would agree that, you know, uh, anyone in our community that has an ongoing health condition needs to stay in touch with, with their doctor. Um, mm -hmm. You know, everyone is, is pretty much open to telemedicine appointments and, yeah. um, you know, you don't necessarily have to go into the office, but, you know, you need to stay on your treatment plan, talk with your doctor, uh, because, um, that's important right now for everyone to stay healthy and and uh, and not make any drastic changes where you end up do having to go into a healthcare facility. Right now, it's a mm -hmm. we want to try to you know keep everybody safe at home. I think that would be a good cliffhanger for our next uh, episode. Is is how does the telehealth component now play into your your kidney practice and, and the maintenance? Mm -hmm. You know, especially for the patients that don't yeah. need dialysis. Sure. You know. 
Yep. Yeah. Yep. Sounds good. J- uh, any any last thoughts, Adam, Jills, Ashok, before we before we wrap up? No, no. Thank you for having uh, given me the opportunity to to speak about this, and uh, yeah, appreciate it. Mm-hmm.